And here we are. Tails and cocktails. Tails and cocktails. My dears, tonight I want to do a short story called Nightclub by Catherine Brush. Now, Catherine Brush, let's keep it this way. After a high school education, I got this off Google, Catherine Brush began her career as a columnist for the Boston Traveler. She published her first book, Glitter, in 1926, but it was her short story, Nightclub, which was published in Harper's Magazine in 1927 that brought her national recognition and an O. Henry Award. She became a well-known contributor to leading magazines of the 1920s and 30s, such as Cosmopolitan and Collier's Weekly. Her most successful work was Red-Headed Woman, 1931, which was made into a film starring Jean Harlow in 1932. So that is Catherine Brush, and here is Nightclub. Promptly at quarter of 10 p.m., Mrs. Brady descended the steps of the elevated. She purchased from the news dealer in the cubbyhole beneath them a next month's magazine and a tomorrow morning's paper. And with these tucked under one plump arm, she walked to the place where the gay green awning marked Club Francais paints a stripe of shade across the glitter glittering sidewalk. Under this awning, Mrs. Brady halted briefly to remark to the six-foot doorman that it looked like rain and to await his performance of his professional duty. When the small green door yawned open, she sighed deeply and plodded in. The foyer was a blackness, an airless, velvet blackness like the inside of a jeweler's box. Four drum-shaped lamps of golden silk suspended from the ceiling gave it light a very little. At the far end of the foyer, there were black stairs, faintly dusty, rippling upward toward an amber radiance. Mrs. Brady approached and ponderously mounted the stairs, clinging with one fist to the mangy velvet rope that railed their edge. From the top, Miss Lena Levin observed the ascent. Miss Levin was the checkroom girl. She had dark at the roots, blonde hair and slender hips, upon which, in moments of leisure, she wore her hands, like buckles of ivory loosely attached. This was a moment of leisure. Miss Levin waited behind her counter, row upon row of hooks, empty as yet, and seeming to beckon, curved fingers of iron, waited behind her. Late, said Miss Levin, again. Go on, said Mrs. Brady. It's only ten to ten. Phew, them stairs. She leaned heavily sideways against Miss Levin's counter and applying one palm to the region of her heart, appeared at once to listen and to count. Feel, she cried then in a pleased voice. Miss Levin obediently felt. Them stairs, continued Mrs. Brady darkly, <clears throat> with my bad heart, will be the death of me. Phew! <clears throat> well, dearie, what's the news? You got a paper, Miss Levin languidly reminded her. Yeah, agreed Mrs. Brady, with sudden vehemence. I got a paper. She slapped it upon the counter. And a lot of time I'll get to read my paper, won't I now? <clears throat> On a Saturday night, she moaned. Other nights is bad enough, dear knows, but Saturday nights, how I dread them. Every Saturday night, I say to my daughter, I say, Geraldine, I can't. I say, I can't go through it again, and that's all there is to it, I say. I'll quit, I say, and that I will, too, added Mrs. Brady firmly, if indefinitely. Miss Levin, in defense of Saturday nights, mumbled some vague something about tips, Tips, Mrs. Brady hissed it. She almost spat it. I just wish, said Mrs. Brady, and glared at Miss Levin. I just wish you had to spend one Saturday night, just one, in that dressing room, being pushed and stepped on and near knocked down by that gang of hussies 
and them ordering and bossing you around and using your things and then saying, they're sorry, they got no change, they'll be back. Yeah, they never come back. There's Mr. Costello, whispered Miss Levin through lips that, like a ventriloquist's, scarcely stirred. And as I was saying, Mrs. Brady said at once brightly, I got to leave you. Ten to ten time I was on the job. She smirked at Miss Levin, nodded, and right about faced. There indeed Mr. Costello was. Mr. Billy Costello, manager, proprietor, monarch of all he surveyed. From the doorway of the big room where the little tables herded in a ring around the waxen floor, he surveyed Mrs. Brady, and in such a way that Mrs. Brady, momentarily forgetting her bad heart, walked fast, scurried faster, almost ran. The door of her domain was set politely in an alcove, beyond silken curtains looped up at the sides. Mrs. Brady reached it breathless, shouldered it open, and groped for the electric switch. Lights sprang up, a bright white blaze, intolerable for an instant to the eyes, like sun on snow. Blinking, Mrs. Brady shut the door. The room was a spotless, white tile place, half beauty shop, half dressing room. Along one wall stood washstands, sturdy triplets in a row, with pale green liquid soap in glass balloons afloat above them. Against the opposite wall there was a couch. A third wall backed an elongated glass top dressing table, and over the dressing table and over the washstands, long rectangular sheets of mirror reflected lights, doors, glossy tiles, lights multiplied. Mrs. Brady moved across this glitter like a thick, dark cloud in a hurry. At the dressing table, she came to a halt and upon it she laid her newspaper, her magazine, and her purse, a black purse worn gray with much clutching. She divested herself of a rusty black coat and a hat of the mushroom persuasion, and hung both up in a corner cupboard, which she opens by means of one of a quite preposterous bunch of keys. From a nook in the cupboard, she took down a lace-edged handkerchief with long streamers, she untied the streamers and tied them again around her chunky black alpaca waist. The handkerchief became an apron's baby cousin. Mrs. Brady relocked the cupboard door, fumbled her key ring over, and unlocked a capacious drawer of the dressing table. She spread a fresh towel on the plate glass top in the geometrical center, and upon the towel she arranged with care a procession of things fished from the drawer. Things for the hair, things for the complexion, things for the eyes, the lashes, the brows, the lips, and the fingernails. Things in boxes, and things in jars, and things in tubes and tins. Also an ashtray, matches, pins, a tiny sewing kit, a pair of scissors. Last of all, a hand-printed sign, a nudging sort of sign. Notice, these articles placed here for your convenience are the property of the maid. And directly beneath the sign, propping it up against the looking glass, a china saucer, in which Mrs. Brady now slyly laid decoy money, two quarters and two dimes, in four-leaf clover formation. Another drawer of the dressing table yielded a bottle of Broma Seltzer, a bottle of aromatic spirits of ammonia, a tin of sodium bicarbonate, and a teaspoon. These were lined up on a shelf above the couch. Mrs. Brady was now ready for anything, and from the grim, thin pucker of her mouth, expecting it. Music came to her ears, rather the beat of music, muffled, rhythmic, remote. She sat on the couch and opened her newspaper, and for some moments she read uninterruptedly, with special attention to the murders, the divorces, the breaches of promise, the funnies. Then the door swung inward, 
emitting a blast of the music's beat, a whiff of perfume and a girl. Mrs. Brady put her paper away. The girl was petite and darkly beautiful, wrapped in fur and mounted on tall, jeweled heels. She sat down in one of the chairs that faced the dressing table. She doffed her wrap, casting it carelessly over the chair back. It had a cloth of gold lining, and the name of a Paris house was embroidered in curlicues on the label. Mrs. Brady hovered solicitously near. The dark little girl looked over the articles placed here for your convenience and picked up the scissors. Having cut off a very small hangnail with the air of one performing a perilous major operation, she seized and used the manicure buffer, and after that, the eyebrow pencil. Mrs. Brady's mind, hopefully calculating the tip, jumped and jumped again like, like a taxi meter. The dark little girl applied powder and lipstick belonging to herself. She examined the results searchingly in the mirror and sat back, satisfied. She cast some silver clink, clink into Mrs. Brady's saucer and half rose. Then remembering something, she settled down again. The ensuing 30 seconds were spent by her pulling off a platinum wedding ring, tying it in a corner of a lace handkerchief and tucking the handkerchief down the bodice of her tight white velvet gown. There, she said. She swooped up her wrap and trotted toward the door, jeweled heels and merrily twinkling. The door fell shut. Almost instantly it opened again, and another girl came in. A blonde, this. She was pretty in a round-eyed, doll-like way, but Mrs. Brady, regarding her, mentally grabbed the spirits of ammonia bottle, for she looked terribly ill. The round eyes were dull. The pretty, silly little face was drawn. The thin hands, picking at the fastenings of the spacious beaded bag, trembled and twitched. Mrs. Brady cleared her throat. Can I do something for you, miss? Evidently, the blonde girl had believed herself alone in the dressing room. She started violently and glanced up, panic in her eyes. Panic and something else. Something very like murderous hate, but for an instant only. So that Mrs. Brady, whose perceptions were never quick, missed it altogether. A glass of water, suggested Mrs. Brady. No, said the girl, no. She had one hand in the beaded bag now. Mrs. Brady could see it moving, causing the bag to squirm like a live thing and the fringe to shiver. Yes, she cried abruptly. A glass of water, please. You get it for me. She dropped onto the couch. Mrs. Brady scurried to the water cooler in the corner, pressed the spigot with a determined thumb. When again she faced her patient, the patient was sitting erect. She was thrusting her clenched hand back into the beaded bag again. She took only a sip of the water, but it seemed to help her quite miraculously. Almost at once, color came to her cheeks, life to her eyes. She grew young again, as young as she was. She smiled up at Mrs. Brady. Well, she exclaimed, what do you know about that? She shook her honey-colored head. I can't imagine what came over me. Are you better now? inquired Mrs. Brady. Yes, oh yes, I'm better now. You see, said the blonde girl confidentially, we were at the theater, my boyfriend and I, and it was hot and stuffy. I guess that must have been the trouble. She paused and the ghost of her recent distress crossed her face. God, I thought that last act never would end, she said. While she attended to her hair and complexion, she chattered gaily to Mrs. Brady, chattered on with scarcely a stop for breath, and laughed much. She said, among other things, that she and her boyfriend had not known one another very long, but that she was gaga about him. He is about me, too, she confessed. He thinks I'm grand. She fell silent then. And in the looking glass, her eyes were shadowed, haunted. But Mrs. Brady, from where she stood, could not see the looking glass. 
and half a minute later the blonde girl laughed and began again. When she went out, she seemed to dance out on little winged feet, and Mrs. Brady, sighing, thought it must be nice to be young and happy like that. The next arrivals were two. A tall, extremely smart young woman in black chiffon entered first and held the door open for her companion. And the instant the door was shut, she said as though it had been on the tip of her tongue for hours, Amy, what under the sun happened? Amy, who was brown-eyed, brown-bobbed-haired, and patently annoyed about something, crossed to the dressing table and flopped onto a chair before she made reply. Nothing, she said wearily then. That's nonsense, snorted the other. Tell me, was it something she said? She's a tactless ass, of course, always was. No, not anything she said. It was, Amy bit her lip. All right, I'll tell you. Before we left your apartment, I just happened to notice that Tom had disappeared. So I went to look for him. I wanted to ask him if he'd remembered to tell the maid where we were going. Skippy's subject to croup, you know, and we always leave word. Well, so I went into the kitchen thinking Tom might be there mixing cocktails. And there he was, and there she was. The full red mouth of the other young woman pursed itself slightly. Her arched brows lifted. Well? Her matter-of-factness appeared to infuriate Amy. He was kissing her, she flung out. Well, said the other again. She chuckled softly and patted Amy's shoulder, as if it were the shoulder of a child. You're surely not going to let that spoil your whole evening. Amy, dear, kissing may once have been serious and significant, but it isn't nowadays. Nowadays, it's like shaking hands. It means nothing. But Amy was not consoled. I hate her, she cried desperately. Red-headed thing, calling me darling and honey and sending me handkerchiefs for the Christmas and then sneaking off behind closed doors and kissing my husband. At this point, Amy broke down, but she recovered herself sufficiently to add with venom, I'd like to slap her. Oh, 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 smiled the tall young woman. I wouldn't do that. Amy wiped her eyes with what might well have been one of the Christmas handkerchiefs and confronted her friend. Well, what would you do, Vera, if you were I? I'd forget it, said Vera, and have a good time. I'd kiss somebody myself. You've no idea how much better you'd feel. I don't do... Amy began indignantly, but as the door behind her opened and a third young woman, red-headed, earringed, exquisite, lifted, lilted in, she changed her tone. Oh, hello, she called sweetly, beaming at the newcomer via the mirror. We were wondering what had become of you. The red-headed girl, smiling easily back, dropped her cigarette on the floor and crushed it out with a silver-shod toe. Tom and I were talking to the band leader. He's going to play my favorite. Lend me a comb, will you? There's a comb there, said Vera, indicating Mrs. Brady's business comb. But imagine using it, murmured the red-headed girl. Amy, darling, haven't you got one? Amy produced a tiny comb from her rhinestone purse. Don't forget to bring it when you come, she said and stood up. I'm going on out. I want to tell Tom something. She went. The red-headed young woman and the tall black chiffon one were alone, except for Mrs. Brady. The red-headed one beaded her incredible lashes. The tall one, the one called Vera, sat watching her. Presently, she said, Sylvia, look here. And Sylvia looked. Anybody addressed in that tone would have. There is one thing, Vera went on quietly, holding the other's eyes, that I want understood. And that is, hands off. Do you hear me? 
I don't know what you mean, and you do know what I mean. The red-headed girl shrugged her shoulders. Amy told you she saw us, I suppose. Precisely. And, went on Vera, gathering up her possessions and rising, as I said before, you are to keep away. Her eyes blazed sudden white-hot rage. Because, as you very well know, he belongs to me, she said, and departed, slamming the door. Between 11 o'clock and 1, Mrs. Brady was very busy indeed. Never for more than a moment during those two hours was the dressing room empty. Often it was jammed, full to overflowing with curled, cropped heads, with ivory arms and shoulders, with silk and lace and chiffon, with legs. The door flapped in and back, in and back. The mirrors caught and held and lost a hundred different faces. Powder veiled the dressing table with a thin white dust. Cigarette stubs, scarlet at the tips, choked the ash receiver. Dimes and quarters clattered into Mrs. Brady's saucer and were transferred to Mrs. Brady's purse. The original 70 cents remained. That much and no more would Mrs. Brady gamble on the integrity of womanhood. She earned her money. She threaded needles and took stitches. She powdered the backs of necks. She supplied towels for soapy, dripping hands. She removed a speck from a teary blue eye and pounded the heel on a slipper. She curled the straggling ends of a black bob and a gray bob, pinned a velvet flower on a lithe round waist, mixed three doses of bicarbonate of soda, took charge of a shed pink saddle girdle, satin girdle, collected on hands and knees several dozen fake pearls that had wept from a broken string. She served chorus girls and school girls, gay young matrons and gayer young mistresses. A lady who had divorced four husbands and a lady who had poisoned one. The secret, more or less, sweetheart of a most distinguished name and the brains of a bootleg gang. She saw things. She saw a yellow check with the ink hardly dry. She saw four tiny bruises, such as fingers might make, on an arm. She saw a girl strike another girl, not playfully. She saw a bundle of letters some man wished he had not written, safe and deep in a brocaded handbag. About midnight, the door flew open and at once was pushed shut and a grey-eyed, lovely child stood backed against it, her palms flattened on the panels at her side, the draperies of her white chiffon gown settling lightly to rest around her. There were already five dams damsels of various ages in the dressing room. The latest arrival marked their pleasant presence with a flick of her eye, and standing just where she was, she called peremptorily, Maid! Mrs. Brady, starting, standing just where she was, said, Yes, miss? Please come here, said the girl. Mrs. Brady, as slowly as she dared, did so. The girl lowered her voice to a tense half-whisper. Listen, is there any way I can get her out of here, except through this door I came in? Mrs. Brady stared, stared at her stupidly. Any window, persisted the girl, or anything? Here they were interrupted by the exodus of two of the damsels of varying ages. Mrs. Brady opened the door for them, and in doing so, caught a glimpse of a man who waited in the hall outside. A debonair, old, young man with a girl's furry wrap hung over his arm and his hat in his hand. The door clicked. The grey-eyed girl moved out from the wall against which she had flattened herself for all the world like one eluding pursuit in a cinema. What about that window? She demanded, pointing. That's all the father had opened, said Mrs. Brady. Oh, and it's the only one, isn't it? It is. Damn, said the girl. Then there's no way out? No way but the door, said Mrs. Brady testily. The girl looked at the door. 
She seemed to look through the door and to despise and to fear what she saw. Then she looked at Mrs. Brady. Well, she said, then I suppose the only thing for me to do is to stay in here. She stayed. Minutes ticked by. Jazz crooned distantly, stopped, struck up again. Other girls came and went. Still, the gray-eyed girl sat on the couch with her back to the wall and her shapely legs crossed, smoking cigarettes, one from the stub of another. After a long while, she said, Maid, yes, miss, peek at that door, will you, and see if there's anyone standing there. Mrs. Brady peeked and reported that there was. There was a gentleman with a little bit of a black mustache standing where, there. The same gentleman, in fact, who was standing there just after you came in. Oh, Lord, sighed the gray-haired girl. Well, I can't stay here all night. That's one sure thing. She slid off the couch and went listlessly to the dressing table. There she occupied herself for a minute or two. Suddenly, without a word, she darted out. Thirty seconds later, Mrs. Brady was elated to find two crumpled one-dollar bills lying in her saucer. Her joy, however, died a premature death, for she made an almost simultaneous second discovery, a saddening one, above all a puzzling one. Now what for, marveled Mrs. Brady, did she want to walk off with them scissors? This at 12.25. At 12.30, a quartet of excited young things burst in, babbling madly. All of them had their evening wraps with them, all talked at once. One of them, a Dresden China girl with a heart-shaped face, was the center of attraction. Around her, the rest fluttered like monstrous butterflies. To her, they addressed their shrill exclamatory cries. Babe, they called her. Mrs. Brady heard snatches. Not in this state, unless... Well, you can in Maryland, Jimmy says. Oh, there must be some place nearer there. Isn't this marvelous? When did it happen, babe? When did you decide? Just now, the girl with the heart-shaped face sang softly. When we were dancing. The babble resumed. But listen, babe, what are your mother and father? Oh, never mind, let's hurry. Shall we be warm enough with just these thin wraps, do you think? Babe, will you be warm enough? Sure. Powder flew and little pocket combs marched through bright Marcel's. Flushed cheeks were painted pinker still. My pearls, said Babe, are old, and by dressing my slippers are new. New, let's see, what can I borrow? A lace handkerchief, a diamond bar pin, a pair of earrings were proffered. She chose the bar pin, and its owner unpinned it proudly, gladly. I've got blue garters, exclaimed a shrill little girl in a silver dress. Give me one then, directed Babe. I'll trade with you. There, that fixes that. More babbling. Hurry, hurry up. Listen, are you sure we'll be warm enough? Because we can stop at my house. There's absolutely nobody home. Give me that puff, Babe. I'll powder your back. And just to think a week ago you had never even met each other. Oh, hurry up, let's get started. I'm ready, so am I. Ready, babe? You look adorable. Come on, everybody. They were gone again, and the dressing room seems twice as still and vacant as before. A minute of grace, during which Mrs. Brady wiped the spilled powder away with a damp gray rag. Then the door jumped open again. Two evening gowns appeared and made for the dressing table in a beeline. Slim, tubular gowns they were, one green, one palish yellow. Yellow hair went with the green gown, brown hair with the yellow. The green-gowned, yellow-haired girl wore gardenias on her left shoulder, four of them, and a flashing bracelet on each fragile wrist. The other girl looked less prosperous. Still... You would rather have looked at her. Both ignored Mrs. Brady's cosmetic display as utterly as they ignored Mrs. Brady, producing full field equipment of their own. Well, said the girl with the gardenias, 
rouging energetically. How do you like him? Oh, all right. Meaning not any. I suspected as much. The girl with gardenias turned in her chair and scanned her companion's profile with disapproval. See here, Merrily, she drawled. Are you going to be a damn fool all your life? He's fat, said Merrily dreamily. Fat and greasy, sort of. I mean, greasy in his mind. Don't you know what I mean? I know one thing, declared the other. I know who he is. And if I were you, that's all I'd need to know. Under the circumstances. The last three words, stressed meaningfully, affected the girl called merrily curiously. She grew grave. Her lips and lashes drooped. For some seconds, she sat frowning a little, breaking a black sheath lipstick in two and fitting it together again. She's worse, she said finally, low. Worse? Merrily nodded. Well, said the girl with gardenias, there you are. It's the climate. She'll never be anything but worse if she doesn't get away. Out west, Arizona or somewhere. I know, murmured Merrily. The other girl opened a tin of eyeshadow. Of course, she said dryly. <laughs> Suit yourself. She's not my sister. Merrily said nothing. Quiet, she sat, breaking the lipstick, mending it breaking it. Oh, well, she breathed finally, wearily, and straightened up. She propped her elbows on the plate glass dressing table top and leaned toward the mirror. And with the lipstick, she began to make her coral pink mouth very red and gay and reckless and alluring. Nightly at one o'clock, Vane and Moreno danced for the Club Francais. They dance a tango, they dance a waltz. Then, by way of encore, they do a trick of their own called the wheel. They dance for 20, 30 minutes. And while they dance, you do not leave your table, for this is what you came to see. Vane and Moreno, the New York thrill. From one until half past then was Mrs. Brady's recess. She had been looking forward to it all the evening long. When it began, when the opening chords of the tango music sounded sterilly from the room outside, Mrs. Brady brightened. With a right good will, she sped the departing guests. Alone, she unlocked her cupboard and took out her magazine, the magazine she had bought three hours before. Heaving a great breath of relief and satisfaction, she plumped herself on the couch and fingered the pages. Immediately she was absorbed, her eyes drinking up printed lines, her lips moving soundlessly. The magazine was Mrs. Brady's favorite. Its stories were true stories taken from life, so the editor said. And to Mrs. Brady, they were live, vivid threads in the dull, drab pattern of her night. And that is Nightclub by Catherine Brush. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I really do. I'm so glad finally to read it, and I hope you've enjoyed it. So that is it for tonight's Tales and Cocktails. Please join me next Wednesday for another edition of Tales and Cocktails. Meanwhile, we'll see if we get snow tonight. Take care, everybody. Hope to see you next week. Bye now.